I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, Jessica Walpew. Jessica is an object conservator at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. She holds an MA in art history and archeology span with advanced certificate in conservation from NYU's Institute of Fine Arts Conservation Center. With a background in archeological and anthropological collections, she has worked on archeological projects in Turkey, Italy, and Peru. At Cooper Hewitt, she works primarily with the product design and decorative arts collection, as well as with the Digital Acquisitions Working Group. Jessica's presentation is called Rethinking Plasticity. Please join me in welcoming Jess. Hi, thank you for that introduction. Thanks everyone for being here. Just wait while we get set up. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about um, Nature by Design Plastics, which is an exhibition at Cooper Hewitt that opens in June. It's co-curated by Cindy Trope, our Associate Curator of Product Design and Decorative Arts and two of the museum's conservators, Kira and Wilmot, a textile conservator, and myself in objects. The exhibition treads the line between the history of technology, material science, and the history of fashion and decorative arts. The exhibition has unfortunately been delayed by the government shutdown. And so while it was supposed to have opened in February, this talk is now a sneak preview of the exhibition and its themes. I do want to give credit to my predecessor, Annie Hall, for working with Cindy on the genesis of this exhibition many years before I joined Smithsonian, um, back when Smithsonian funded research into the, quote, age of plastics. And our work on this is continuing today. So... Cooper Hewitt is a really unique museum in that we're focused on the world of design from historic to contemporary. Our collection of over 200,000 objects spans millennia. While we have no permanent collections, galleries, or second floor exhibitions, focus on themes drawn out by the curatorial staff and pulled from all four of our curatorial departments. Wall coverings, drawings, prints, and graphics de graphic design, product design, and decorative arts, and textiles. And you'll see some objects from each of these categories in this presentation. A consistent thread among our collection shows is a desire to draw connections between the history of design and its future. Historic collections serve as inspiration for designers, and our collection is uniquely focused on the design process. We aspire to be a platform for design and an inspiration to contemporary designers. Here I'm showing a few objects to that describe designers' process and experimentation with materials. As the museum's conservators, you can imagine that we're excited by this collecting priority. So this talk discusses how conservation and material science perspective is integral to the history and future of design materials. Plastics are really a key concern for conservators charged with caring for modern and contemporary collections. The show Natural Plastics highlights historical objects from the Cooper Hewitt collection made of pre- and early industrial polymers. These substances sourced from plants and animals were precursors of the modern petroleum-based plastics we've, that have become indispensable to our daily activities. The natural plastics highlighted in this exhibition include tortoiseshell and horn, gutta percha, vulcanized rubber, and queer bully, boiled leather. A section on semi-synthetic cellulose derivatives includes the key early plastics cellulose nitrate and cellulose acetate, and the cellulose-derived fiber rayon. The show also features innovative contemporary bioplastics, part of the current sustainable design movement, which I'll be discussing in greater detail toward the end of the presentation. So if we're going to talk about plastics, we better start with some definitions. For the purposes of my presentation, plastics are materials that can be molded or shaped, usually with heat and or pressure. This also gives us a definition of plasticity, the ability to be molded. We associate plastics with flexibility, strength, and novel aesthetics. In the scene from the movie Sabrina from 1954, Humphrey Bogart asks 10 secretaries to jump up and down on a new plastic material to demonstrate its resilience. I thought about including a scene from The Graduate, but I didn't. You're welcome. <laughs> so plastics are made of polymers. They can be natural or synthetic, meaning derived from refined petrochemicals. Organic polymers are large macromolecules made of identical repeating units of atoms, usually based on a carbon backbone, and I have limited the number of chemical diagrams in the presentation. You're also welcome. The engineered and semi-synthetic um, and bioplastic categories of materials have a wide range of designed properties and fit a multitude of uses. Plastics can, in fact, do almost anything you ask them to. There are three main classes of polymers when you're looking at their behavior. In thermoplastics, the chains of polymers are able to move around each other. They have an amorphous structure. These materials are molded when warm, and on cooling, the material sort of freezes or crystallizes into place, but they can still be reheated to be reshaped. Thermoset polymers are not able to be reshaped. 
their polymers are usually cross-linked together through various means. In synthetic polymers, this is done using catalysts, but as I'll describe, some of the natural polymers can also have um, thermoset characteristics. Elastomers share some of the properties of both thermosets and thermoplastics, and they're uh, particularly important for shock absorbency, have many, many um, applications today. Uh, chemists and engineers have found various ways to exploit the polymer chemistry, that is, the polymer structure and processing pathways, in order to customize new materials to suit our evolving needs. Many of these new materials bridge the gaps between these basic categories, and I would like to point out that natural materials continue to serve as inspiration for designers working at the cutting edge of material science and engineering today. So natural plastics predecessors. Um, from ancient cultures through the industrial era, artisans and designers have embraced natural polymers plasticity to create durable, appealing, water, and chemically resistant functional objects. Natural plastics materials include these proteinaceous antecedents to modern plastics, including keratin and collagen, which we'll discuss in a little more detail. The natural sources also include plants. Conservators are very familiar with the properties of resins used in varnishes and adhesives and plant exudates are widely used natural resources, today we'll be focusing on natural rubber latex, which is released from trees. First, let's like, take a look at some of the animal-derived materials. These are all objects in our show, made of horn and tortoise shell, which are prized for their translucency. Both are made of keratin, a structural protein found in animal hair, wool, feathers, horn, nails, and hooves. While it's an organic material, it's harder and more resistant to water and other chemicals and other types of tissues, and this is due to a high sulfide content making it very resilient in its biological functions of protecting animals from harm and absorbing shock. Both materials are thinned or delaminated from their raw state and treated with heat or moisture to form them into thin, translucent sheets. They can be molded, flattened, or cut. Common examples in museum collections are small decorative boxes, toilette items, flattened tortoiseshell veneers, of course, used in bull marquetry. One really interesting object in our natural plastic show is this box. You're seeing the front and the reverse. Um, it's made of tortoiseshell inlaid with silver and mother of pearl. The scenes shown on the top and the bottom of the small box show manufacturing techniques, much like a plate from this Diderot encyclopedia. And it's roughly contemporaneous, 18th or 19th century. Moving on to plant-derived materials. Gutta percha is probably an unfamiliar term to some of you in the audience. It's a variant of natural rubber from plant latex found in Southeast Asia. It has very few uses today, having been replaced mostly by synthetic materials, but you may find it at your dentist. I think it's still used to fill um, root canals. In the mid-19th century, telegraph wires, like you see here, were insulated with gutta percha. This has an interesting collections history because Peter Cooper, grandfather of the Hewitt sisters, the founders of the Cooper Hewitt collection, was one of the sponsors of the first telegraph cable to be stretched across the Atlantic Ocean in 1858. And this little section was mounted by Tiffany and Company as a little souvenir. Gutta percha softens at relatively low temperatures. It can be molded or extruded. It has an extremely low coefficient of thermal expansion and contraction, which in addition to its electric insulation capabilities, makes it suitable for making molds, dyes, and castings, and serving as insulation in, in wires. Raw latex rubber extracted from trees was processed in many ways in the 19th century, and also historically through ancient, you know, from ancient times. It could be heated, smoked, masticated, dried, or treated with a slew of other modification techniques to enhance its desired properties. But it still had this flaw of melting in heat and cracking in cold weather. So in the early to mid-19th century, a large improvement was found. If you heat and add sulfur to natural rubber, you can cross-link the structure, which will introduce new characteristics, curing it of its problems in a technique that was then known as curing and which we now call vulcanization. This development was patented nearly simultaneously by the big names in vulcanized rubber Hancock and Goodyear around 1844, and vulcanized rubber became used for hoses, tires, seals, washers, and a range of other products. Um, including decorative arts under the trade names ebonite and vulcanite, and these are common things that we find in decorative arts collections. All sorts of new interesting processes were invented with corresponding industrial equipment, like a rolling mill, like you see above, and calendars, which enabled production of vulcanized rubber on really large scales. These types of mechanized equipment laid the groundwork for the synthetic polymer processing industry. Rubber production on a global scale was facilitated by British colonial ventures, and eventually during supply shortages during the World War, attention focused on synthetic elastomer substitutes. The match safe I'm showing you here, which is about 1,000 times actual size, it's this big. Um, it's made of vulcanized rubber, which is fire resistant and moisture resistant, which is a good insulating material for housing flammable matches. And Cooper Hewitt has a really interesting collection of over 4,000 match safes made of very interesting early plastic materials. Um, so beginning in the 19th century, scientists manipulated cellulose to drive new fibers. The first major important one was known as artificial silk or rayon. Um, this fabulous woven picture of the DuPont World's Fair building is also made of, um, of rayon. 
and the new technology was highlighted at the fair with a rayon spinning machine, along with a machine that added bristles to toothbrushes, and the debut display of DuPont's nylon stockings. This is at the 1939 World's Fair. Um, so to make these semi-synthetic fibers, the cellulose raw material is dissolved in a chemical bath, and then the fiber is extruded using specialized equipment called spinnerets. This mimics the process that silkworms use to make actual silk. So you can see that nature is really inspiring chemistry here. Um, here's a really interesting application, escape and evasion maps, which were given to World War II airmen to avoid capture if they were shot down behind enemy lines, were originally printed on silk, which was at that time also used for parachutes. But blocked supply lines forced the development of substitutes, um, substitutes, and this is made also of rayon. So today there are many more options for synthetic and even recycled plastic polyester fibers, but the birth of the synthetic fiber industry was based on these cellulose-derived fibers, including artificial silk. Today, um, Lots of new materials have been substituted for the aggressive chemicals originally used in these processes, and sustainably harvested materials are sought by eco-conscious designers, which has brought these 19th century fibers back in fashion. In product design and decorative arts, cellulose-derived plastic, cellulose acetate, and cellulose nitrate were widely used in the late 19th and early 20th century before the advent of more synthetic substitutes. While in conservation, most attention has gone to their use as film stocks, many objects are found throughout museum collections. And here we can see a few different imitation tortoiseshell boxes, which I hope you can see are warped, one of the signs of uh, deter deteriorating early plastics. These two plastics also off-gas acidic vapors as they age, affecting objects around them and causing more autocatalytic destruction. I'm showing primarily synthetic substitutes for tortoiseshell here because they relate to the other tortoiseshell objects we were looking at, but both cellulose nitrate and cellulose acetate were used as ivory substitutes like this brise fan. Um, in many of their uses, both of these have been replaced by other polymers given their known stability issues, but um, cellulose nitrate continues to be used as a lacquer and coating in a lot of different industries. So both natural plastics and synthetic plastics are organic materials subject to deterioration by the same agents of deterioration that affect other museum objects. Chemical, physical, and biological deterioration affect both the structure and the surface of plastic objects. I want to explore a little bit more how the composition and manufacturing of these polymeric materials affects their lifespans, which is my primary concern as a conservator. As a manufactured material, synthetic plastics are almost always composites containing many different additives, including plasticizers, stabilizers, processing aids, and end-use modifiers. All of these serve to achieve our desired properties. Another very important concept to introduce is the concept of a service lifetime. Industrial products manufactured for a broad consumer base are meant to meet certain specifications with the understanding that they only last for a certain amount of time, which I'm sure I don't have to tell you is not equivalent to a museum lifetime. So by mid-century, most of the main synthetic plastics had already been developed. In this 1947 trade publication, you can already see cellulose nitrate, cellulose acetate, polystyrene, polyethylene, and acrylic resins. We are now only... Um, reaching the end of the lifespan for most of these materials in our design collections, which is about 50 to 100 years. A big attraction for synthetic plastics is that they can be designed to meet any need and engineered for predictable performance. And so these plastics offer designers many new possibilities. But of course, for conservation, plastics are a pretty big problem. From a conservation perspective, plastics as they degrade begin to act as systems out of equilibrium. As aging occurs, chemical deterioration of the base polymer and additives proceed with natural exposure to the environment. Oxidation, hydrolysis, and free radical reactions can chemically change the base polymer. Particularly important for us is how those additives and plasticizers change. Physical diffusion and molecular redistribution within the plastic can also cause damage. Initially, those plasticizers and additives are selected to be compatible with the base polymer. And as they age, those stabilizers get used up and macromolecular rearrangements can create areas of crystallinity, causing cross-linking and shrinking, pushing those additives to the surface. The surfaces bloom or have thin layers of exudates on the surface as those materials make their way to the interface with the air. And here you can see this great um, illustration, all, all different objects in the Cooper Hewitt collection, which was put together during, sorry, Kate um, White Tyler's survey of our, of our collection. As for many other polymeric materials, metal contaminants catalyze de de deterioration, and this is especially a problem in a product design collection where we have a lot of mixed composite materials. Color changes are also a particular concern for us, as dyes used in plastic formulations may be extremely light sensitive and could either fade or darken. So plastics are a problem for conservators because they degrade relatively quickly in the scope of museum conservation. And this is assuming that we continue to expect a pristine appearance for them, having not yet developed a cultural appreciation of plastic patina. But 
Plastics are a problem for conservators for the exact opposite reasons. They're an environmental problem. From one perspective, my perspective, they degrade far too rapidly. And from another, they don't ever degrade enough. So unfortunately, at the same time that museum collections of plastic objects are imperiled by their natural aging, we're facing a huge ecological crisis and that consumption of plastics has gone on for decades without adequate plans for how to recycle them or manage the waste they cause. While plastics degrade in terms of their appearance and structure, they rarely break down so far as to return to organic matter that can be reused by living organisms. Instead, littering our soils and seas with microplastics, which mass together in the Pacific trash dryer, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, under 10% of plastics are currently being recycled, and with the proliferation of so many different kinds, not all of them are economically viable to recycle. So designers have responded to this crisis by creating innovative solutions and provocative works of art. I'm going to describe some newer innovations by designers and also in the plastics industry and talk about how eco-conscious designers have been embracing bioplastics and biodegradable plastics, which we now have in the Cooper Hewitt collection. So while some designers have worked to make reusable substitutes for single-use plastics, others have drawn attention to the ecological ramifications of plastic everywhere in our streets, landfills, and oceans. The transplastic chair, which you see on the side there, was designed by the Campana Brothers specifically for Cooper Hewitt's Campana Brothers Selects Exhibition. It takes inspiration from an imaginary battle between nature and plastic. The organic wicker chair expels plastic elements, such as cleaning product bottles and other plastic trash. Um, Adidas, the sneaker and apparel design giant, have worked with Parlay for the Ocean to make products using fiber recycled from that ocean plastic, and you see the different stages in production down in the corner there. Other designers have taken inspiration from industrial and commercial recycling, but transformed the process into something artisanal. Designers like Dave Hawkins and Shahar Levna have invented new ways of working with plastics. Hawkins recycled plastic machine at the bottom here, mills up and recombines plastic to be reused for new purposes on a domestic scale. Levene's lithoplast material considers how we may be able to mine metamorphosized plastic from our landfills in a future geology. In our Natural Plastics exhibition, we highlight just a few examples of elegant designs made of eco-friendly bioplastics. Sulapat containers use standard molding equipment but are made of wood pulp and a biodegradable resin that allows these packaging containers to compost according to EU standards. I should note that while I'm using the term bioplastic to mean the opposite of a polymer derived from fossil resources, this isn't a very specific use of the term. It implies something ecologically friendly, but indeed not all bioplastics are environmentally friendly. This is a field absolutely overrun with greenwashing, which is misleading marketing, implying unsubstantiated environmental benefits. To be more specific, we're talking about two different aspects of a polymer's life cycle. One, where does it come from? And two, how does it degrade? This is a brief primer on some of the major bioplastics you should know about. Um, according to that IUPAC definition, a bio-based polymer is derived from biomass. Essentially, they're made from non-fossil fuel, non fuel feedstocks. Therefore, you can have bio-based polyethylene, which is becoming very common. It's a standard plastic that is processed in ind industry standard ways and can be recycled, or for that matter, inappropriately thrown in the trash, where it will take centuries to degrade. The sources for these bio-based polymers are things like corn and sugarcane in the U.S., potatoes, beets, wheat, or other plants elsewhere in the world. While these bio-based polymers began to be developed in the 19th century with these early plastics that we've already discussed, not many of them found wide commercial viability compared to synthetic plastics. While many of the biopolymers lack performance characteristics like impact resistance or thermal resistance, they can be blended with additives, as with purely synthetic polymers, to achieve similar properties. To me, one of the most interesting aspects of bioplastics research that was new to me is that standards have been developed to use carbon-14 signatures to determine the amount of bio-based content in polymers, biopolymers in a way to counteract some of this greenwashing. So the ability to biodegrade is the other side of that coin, right? Where does it come from? Where does it go? The second key aspect, globally, governments have been issuing standards to regulate the manufacture of bioplastics and what it means when a company says their product is compostable. How long does it take to break down in industrial or home composting environments? Among the most pre prevalent polymers currently in the bioplastics field are thermoplastic starch, uh, polylactic acid, and polyhydroxyalcoanate. Thermoplastic starch is renewable, biodegradable, easily modified, and available at a very low cost globally, making it a very attractive raw material for green plastics. Um, it's processed in shear conditions with heat and limited water content to totally change the way that the starch um, orients itself. PLA is produced by extracting dextrose, so sugar, from corn, which is then fermented by yeast to pr produce lactic acid, the monomer for PLA. It's produced in great quantities in the Midwest of the U.S. by a company called NatureWorks. PHA is a polyester-like polymer produced by fermentation of sugar or lipids by bacteria, and it consists of more than 150 different types of monomers, yielding many different end-use properties. 
the important aspect here is really that most of these um, materials are actually made into alloys or plastic alloys or biocomposites. So um, while this is usually proprietary information, what we're dealing with in museums is actually a mix of all of these different polymers together. While the environmental impact of bioplastics is very hard to quantify at this stage, given many different aspects of greenness related to their production, like water use, energy use, deforestation, biodegradation, etc., suffice it to say these materials are now very prevalent in the design world and not just for single-use packaging. From a conservation perspective, these materials are pretty unpredictable. First, we don't know what's in them. And second, we would expect them to be extra sensitive to light, heat, and moisture, and so require special considerations in their housing and display in the museum environment. In packaging applications, it's clear that rapid disintegration is part of the design brief for those objects. But bioplastics are also widely used for high concept art and design. Here are two more objects in the exhibition. Um, for conservators in a design museum, we'll see more and more of these bio-based and biodegradable polymers in our collections. We collect across the categories of industrial design, packaging design, and like these vessels, design objects which really stretch the limits of what the materials can do. These vessels, in the name of the design firm itself, Handmade Industrials, are evidence of this interesting overlap between the commercial and artisanal facets of the world of design. These vessels are made of polycaprolactone, another biodegradable polymer with promising characteristics. Originally developed in the medical field, here it's used by the designers to mold organic vases using an innovative hand molding technique. And I have a sample in my purse and I will share it with you later. So to this point, we've mostly followed a pretty chronological approach starting with natural materials and moving toward innovations that substitute for them. But I don't want to imply a strict chronology with the adoption of plastics leading to the disuse of naturally derived materials. Our exhibition also showcases examples of novel design approaches where the designers have focused on natural or historical polymers. These two objects are separated in time by about a century, but both speak to designers' fascination with the contrast of these versatile natural plastics. The birdcage is made from a wealth of natural polymeric materials, horn, tortoiseshell, and ivory and the tortoiseshell band at the bottom is backed with vermilion to enhance its color. The um, bars of the cage are made of horn. Very interesting. For the winged vessel on this side, felt designer Jory Johnson and furniture maker Clifton Monteith collaborated on a technique for the creation of vessels incorporating both felt and lacquer. While lacquer is a natural polymeric material, um, it comes from the sap of a plant in the poison ivy family, which as it cures, polymerizes to yield a robust impermeable surface. And there's been a lot of conservation research on lacquer. While many different lacquer substrates and modifiers have been used historically, and the process is widespread throughout Asia and also other parts of the world, Johnson wondered whether wool fibers and felt could be used as the curing agent. This led to the pair's fruitful experiments with materials and process. The novel felt lacquer composite takes advantage of the structural characteristics of the wool to give the lacquer greater strength and integrity, and the designers have called the result Mother Nature's Fiberglass. Their work ingeniously uses two old methods combined in a new way to produce an organic design object. And this vessel exam exemplifies the guiding role materials can play in the creation of a new design. Just one more example. One more example from the Botanica series, which um, resulted from the design studio Forma Fantasma's interest in pre-industrial plastics and was commissioned by an Italian foundation dedicated to art conservation and research in the plastics field. The objects in this series are designed as if the oil-based era in which we are living never took place, according to the designers. The designers prototype natural materials to experiment with the, pro the mis mixing of textures and colors. And so these material samples, which again you see much larger than life size, um, represent copal resin, dewaxed and natural shellax, and bois de sea, which is a mixture of wood, flour, and albumin. In this case, sourced from egg, though historically um, it was used uh, using horse blood, lots of horse blood. It's a very common material in the late 19th century. Um, these are great examples of process materials in our collection and represent a critical component of this broader material narrative. The resulting Botanica vessels celebrate organic aesthetics inspired by the natural polymers, which they're, which they're derived from. And this is a new aesthetics of plasticity, as our curators have described it. What these projects represent is a rediscovered interest in natural polymers as opposed to synthetics. And this rediscovery is really only possible in the face of the ubiquity of synthetic plastics in our lives. While natural polymers can actually be remarkably stable over museum lifetimes, we now have this ironic problem that bioplastics are often intended to degrade on shorter timescales. If design decay is part of what we value in them, then our goals in preserving them in museum collections need to be rethought. So I think in the contemporary section of the exhibition, I've given you some examples of how designers can rediscover historic techniques and um, materials with a new contemporary sensibility. And this brings up new conservation challenges with bioplastics and biocomposites for us. And I don't think that we can rely on our previous knowledge to chart a path forward in this case. 
For a collection oriented toward process and materiality, um, conservation at Cooper Hewitt may need to respond to different needs and require a different approach. Thinking about the future of bioplastics in our collections, there are certainly a lot of concerns in common with contemporary art, which displays the ephemeral or focuses on materials with un inherently unstable natures. My proposal here is that we try to embrace yet another definition of plasticity. When we talk about neurological plasticity or ecological plasticity, what we mean is adaptability, the ability to reshape according to new conditions. Perhaps these new plastics we see in our collections and galleries belong to this newer paradigm, a paradigm that means conservators as well will need to learn to embrace change instead of arresting it. Thanks. Happy to take questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jess. Uh, I would like to use moderator's privilege, if I may, and start with uh, a <laughs> question. One of the things that I was fascinated about in terms of your career trajectory and where you are now with designing the um, plastics exhibit and thinking about all these conservation issues is that in archaeology, often we're left to interpret the culture based upon the materials that remain rather than the materials that actually were present at the time. And I think this often gives us a very skewed idea of the past. And I think the same thing is becoming true of the plastics industry in the sense of the amount of cellulose nitrate combs, for example, that were produced for women's hair, the fake tortoise shell combs in the turn of the 19th century. And so I wondered if that was something that had been looked into at Cooper Hewitt in terms of some of the documentation of these everyday materials that we just don't have with us anymore. Yeah, we, we actually do have some cellulose nitrate combs in this show, and they'll be encapsulated so that they don't damage other materials, actually. But um, yeah, I think that's an interesting question. I guess it's uh, sort of in the back of my mind that the museum is serving as a repository of material culture. I think one thing that's nice about being a design museum instead of an art museum is that we reflect a little bit broader, I don't want to say more democratic, um, collecting needs, but um, I think Cooper Hewitt is in a really unique position to speak to some of this more material culture, more um, everyday materials. Um, but there are actually a lot of plastics museums already that collect everyday objects. They're not necessarily design museums, they're more materially focused. Um, there are collections in Italy and Massachusetts. There's, I haven't visited any of them yet, so I'd like to, but there are, um, there's sort of a groundswell of um, interest coming a lot out of industry um, in preserving some of those sort of everyday things. We have Tupperware in our, I had a slide with like some of the everyday things that we have in our collection. We have Tupperware, we have Roomba, we have, you know, all sorts of things made of plastic. Uh, there's a really interesting interface between consumer electronics and plastic deterioration where you have both the issues of time-based media conservation and plastics deterioration. So that's sort of our special niche at Cooper Hewitt. Excellent. Yeah. I'd like to open it up to the floor. Um, you threw out a comment very briefly, but um, you said we have not yet developed an appreciation for plastic patina. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could just go a little more into that and the difference between patina and getting old. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that we struggle with for Cooper Hewitt's collection is that we have a really wide range of, of materials. Um, and they age in different ways. So we, we tend not to do very much surface restoration in the conservation work that we do. We tend to display objects appropriate in a way that's appropriate to their age and history. But um, I think culture, I think I'm speaking not necessarily from the curatorial perspective of the museum, but more culturally. Uh, there was a really interesting article some months ago focusing on the Getty's research in plastics. And the comments below usually don't read the comments, but the comments were like, plastics don't belong in museums, plastics are every day, um, old plastics should be thrown out, plastics create a horrible ecological problem. So I think there's a difference, maybe a split between um, museum professionals and certainly those of us working in modern contemporary collections and the general public thinking about the historical relevance of plastics. And so maybe I think this is a dangerous term to invoke patina, but I think it's something that merits more, more consideration. Thanks, Mark. I was, I'm really intrigued by the notion of functionality or function when you're talking about an object itself in relationship to something like plastic. The reason being that sometimes we assign um, the understanding that something is going to be ephemeral, 
that it is intended sort of like your, your combs for a, a use where you're gonna use it for a couple times and it's gonna be discarded and it's not meant for the future. So what does that mean in terms of collecting that and conserving it? And I know this might come across as anti-conservation, I don't mean it to sound like that, um, but is there a way to build into this conversation the actual functionality of something and the nature of trying to keep it uh, going when that would not be original yeah, we have um, we have an interesting example on that question. Uh, some earlier, like 1990s, uh, Nova Mount came out with a product called uh, Matter By, which is like material biodegradable, and it's a very common. Um, it's a starch polypropylene, I think, um, mixture, and it's used for um, you know the kind of disposable utensils. And so we have a couple um, disposable sporks in the collection that we are considering putting in this exhibition and maybe having touch samples. And um, just thinking about what's the intended appearance, like should we show them partially dissolved? Should we, should we even accelerate deterioration given that when there are things that are out commercially available, we can acquire multiple of them? Can we show a range of different things? And I think this is actually coming to the fore for another upcoming exhibition, our Nature Triennial, which opens in May. Um, so you can come and see both exhibitions kind of simultaneously. They're very much in dialogue. In this triennial, we're going to be caring for bacterial cultures, growing plants, doing a whole bunch of other things in the museum where conservation really means promoting their growth instead of arresting change. So I think that's something that is very much at the front of our minds as conservators at Cooper Hewitt right now. We're out of time, and so I'd like to encourage everyone to hold their questions for the panel discussion. And let's uh, thank Jess one more time. Thanks.